Turn with me this morning. I want to share a message with you today. And boy, how fitting of an illustrated message this will be. Um, you know, we, we look around and we see that there are so many faces that aren't here today. So many different people that aren't here. And uh, what? <laughs> wow, I, I'll tell you, when I was preparing this message, uh, I didn't think I would get that illustration amongst the body of, of believers that weren't here. But uh, I'll tell you what, you know, when you think about it, you know, I, I think about that question that, you know, just even this week and over the last few weeks that people have asked, you know, you know, where's so-and-so been? Where's this person been? Where's that person been? And, and, and you know, I, I, I will tell you this. I think, you know, as a pastor, um, you know, uh, I, I want to keep families encouraged. I want to keep families built up and, and keep people moving forward. Um, but, you know, James gives us really clear instruction. It says to be doers of the word only and not hearers. And so my responsibility is not to, let, not to help people apply God's word to their life. They have to apply it for themselves. Amen? Amen. And so when somebody comes and says, hey, we're so-and-so, I haven't seen them lately. Well, you, if you don't have a church directory, we want to encourage you. They're in the Welcome Center. Pick up the phone and give somebody a call. Amen? Don't leave it up to the pastor to follow up. Give somebody a call. But this message today, well, I'll tell you what, you know, you talk about how God has a sense of humor. Amen? 
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Because I think with this message today, there are two things, there's two questions, two questions here that I, I, I want to focus in on with this message. Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to be reading verses 18 through 21. And I'm going to be sharing from the New King James Version. The title of our message this morning is, How About Those Small Things? You talk about God have a sense of humor, just look around this morning, amen. It, we're small in numbers. You see, there's a story, though, that is in the Bible that rings really loud and clear of an individual who started with so many people in a fight, and that army got dwindled down, dwindled down, and dwindled down. You see, but the Lord said, where two or three are gathered in my name, he's there in the midst, amen? So I, I trust today that this message you will have ears to hear, and as this message will just encourage you, because I think w what the question here that we, gonna, we are going to examine today, and what the Lord says in this particular chapter, look at verse 18 and following with me this morning. Then he said, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and put in his garden. And it grew and became a large tree. And the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? There's that question again. It is like a leaven which a woman, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Lord, I pray this morning that these few verses we look at, we would look at what it tells us about being faithful in that which is least. And Lord, I pray this morning, God, open our hearts and our ears and help us to put feet to our faith with this word today. And we'll be sure to honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is a, a self-application message, and it's a participatory message. And what better than to get the body of Christ involved, and we're small in number today, but we're still mighty in power, amen? amen. So, if you'll help me this morning, uh, this is not like maybe a service that you've been involved in on a Sunday morning to preach, and so we're going to have participation Sunday today, amen? Amen. So, I'm going to give you a quiz this morning, and uh, if you know the answer, we just want you to be able to answer these questions. Which country has the largest population? Good. All right. What is the world's tallest mountain? Yes. What type of tree is the tallest? And who are two of the top three richest men in the world? Bill Gates and who's another one? Nah, I wasn't thinking of him. <laughs> How about the guy that owns Berkshire Hathaway? What's his name? Warren Buffett. Right? Okay. So far, so good. We're on the right path. Here's the second half of the quiz. Name one of three places in the world that has the smallest population. Name one, one of three places in the world that has a small population. <laughs> New, our brother says Newberry. <laughs> How about Vatican City? Population of 920. What is the world's smallest mountain? Anybody know? It's Mount Whiteproof in Victoria, Australia. Okay, you'll get this one. What type of tree is the shortest? Bonsai. It's a dwarf willow. It's only two inches in height. I know you're going to get this. I know you'll get this. Who is the world's poorest man? Me. <laughs> His name is Jed Matthews. He owes $22.4 million dollars and has no assets due to bad investments and an internet company. It's the kind of guy I want to go to. Amen. 
But the point of that quiz is I want you to notice, we tend to remember things that are big while we tend to very think of things very little that are very small. In all kinds of ways, we seem to believe that bigger is better. Even when it comes to spiritual things, we think big attendance, big budgets, big buildings, big programs, big talent is what it takes to work in the kingdom of God and is significant to God. And we tend to think the opposite about small things. We sometimes feel like God is not doing much through a small church with a small budget and small programs. We think if it doesn't look impressive, then God must not be blessing it. And not only do we think that way about churches and ministry, we also tend to think that way about ourselves. We may feel like we're not good enough, rich enough, talented enough, or important enough for God to use us in any real significant way. I remember when I first gave my heart to the Lord in 91, in June. In, in, in the summer of 1993, after working on staff for a little over a year at Teen Challenge, I made application to work with the youth group at Painesville Assembly. I worked as a youth sponsor with a youth group that was running probably about 40 kids. It was a church at that time, back in 93, that was running just a little bit over 450 people. Came from a pretty large church, working in the Ministry of Teen Challenge, where we averaged about 50 students on a regular basis. And then after I moved on from Painesville Assembly, I was over at Lakeshore Assembly, and our church attendance at that time was running maybe about 200, 210, 220, somewhere in there. And I also helped work as a youth sponsor over there with a youth group of about 20 to 25 students. So again, coming from there. But you know where the hang-up sometimes comes? I, I hate going to meetings, and, 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 the, and guys will say, well, how big's your church running now? Look around this morning. We're a church that averages right around 75 people. But you know, it's not about numbers. We sometimes get so hung up on some of those things. And we tend to miss out on what the Spirit of God is wanting to do. And we think if it doesn't look impressive, then God must not be blessing it. If it's not big enough. And not only do we think that way about churches and ministry, Sometimes we think that way about ourselves. We may feel like we're not good enough, rich enough, talented enough, or important enough for God to use us in any true significant way. Well, last time I checked, bigger is not always better. According to Jesus, the answer is that resounding no. And when you look at those two, two illustrations Jesus gives and look, Luke 13, he makes this point. Looking at the text again, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree. The birds of the air perched in its branches. And again he said, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a larger amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. You see, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. He told stories and gave comparison to help people catch that new kind of kingdom. In the first example, he said that God's work is like a mustard seed. A mustard seed is very, very small. How small is it? The black mustard seed was the smallest seed ever sown by farmers back in Jesus' time. But that tiny seed grew to the largest herb. It typically grew to be 12 feet, two feet higher than a normal basketball hoop. It was big, bushy enough for birds to build their nest in. And in his second illustration, Jesus said, God's kingdom is like yeast that is mixed in through the bread. 
But what Jesus described was not the daily bread he saw his mother making at home. He described a huge amount of flour. The original Greek in this text talks about three satis of flour. That's about 50 pounds, enough to feed 100 people. And even though the original ball of yeast was small, it had enormous influence. I found a more recent illustration of the power of yeast. Anyone remember the episodes of I Love Lucy? Ricky, huh? Right? From the 1950s, Lucy was mixing some bread dough. But she misread the recipe and put in 13 packs of yeast instead of three packs. And here was the result. Yeast makes a great example of what the kingdom of God is like. God uses small things to accomplish big results. And when his spirit mixes with that bread dough of our human lives, we can rise to any occasion that is given. And the more we have with him, the bigger the results are going to be. I can do all things through Christ, which gives me the strength. Amen? So sometimes we get so wrapped up in numbers that we're missing out what the Spirit of God is really telling us on the impact of touching a life, of ministering. Now we find this principle all through the Word of God. When God created a new nation to call His own, He didn't start with a powerful clan or group. He chose one man and one woman. He chose Abraham and Sarah. And when God was ready to lead His people out of slavery in Egypt, He used a man who was rejected as a leader, who spent most of his life leading sheep in a desert. When God wanted a king to represent his people, he chose a little shepherd by the name of David. And when God came to earth as a human, he came as a baby born in a barn to a poor and insignificant family. When God chose men to start his church, not one of them was wealthy or famous or came from a royal family. He chose common fishermen, laborers, and even a despised tax collector. The principle is still true today. God uses small things to accomplish big purposes. And we need to remember this when we think about ministries we do here at Victory Lane. We get our word from ministry from the Latin root word, which means small things. Now, you've had a Greek and a Latin lesson all in one service. I've exhausted myself this week on study, amen? But when you think about small things, in Luke 16, 10, be faithful in that which is least, if we're going to require those bigger things, right? But that word as a word is minuscule. Most ministry involves small things, like acts, small gestures, everyday service. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 through 29 tells us God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one would boast before Him. You see, God uses small things to do big stuff. And very few people end up having big lives with careers and accomplishments that make headlines. Our lives and our ministries seem to deal with such ordinary things that we can easily lose our enthusiasm. Christians often run out of steam because they don't see the big success that they expected when they're faithful in those small ministries. If we don't see impressive results from our service, we don't see God moving in our ministries, we don't see God doing those things that we are trying to put physical eyesight to, we feel God isn't blessing our efforts, and we get discouraged, and size ultimately becomes our focus. I'll give you an example.
big convoy of hope several years ago. For three years running doing that event, we had over 3,000 people on the fairgrounds at one given time. That was a lot of people. We had five of us that were part of the executive leadership team. That's where Holly got her start in her teaching career on the platform making announcements. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, we come to that place that sometimes we just focus so much on size that we simply lose our focus on the little picture. Knowing that one matter, one matter, one life matters to God. One life, one person comes to Jesus Christ. We get so caught up in that. And God help us not to let that be our focus. You tell me how a core group of 12 people had a vision and a focus to plant in a community to touch lives. And today, God brought us from the beginnings of our timeline to where we're at today. Because it's God. Amen? You've heard me tell the story about my nephew who pastors Rock City Church in Columbus. Church runs a little over 2,000 people. You see, we get so caught up in the comparison trap. Paul said it's not wise to compare ourselves among ourselves. It's not wise. Be careful. This was the one question that I always challenged the district with when I was part of the church planning state team. How much is new conversion versus transfer growth? How many people's lives are being touched with new conversions, new people coming to Christ, rather than people transferring from one church to another because it's an exciting moment because they're doing big things. Well, pastor, I think we should change the lighting in the sanctuary. I think we need to, we need to get some smoke and some mirrors and stuff. And Man, I mean, come on, Kevin. We need to be starting to play some Christian rock. We, we get so caught up in appearances that we're missing out on the Spirit of God. We get so caught up in, in some of that stuff. Now, let's take another quiz. Can somebody name the last five Heisman Trophy winners? Come on. Come on. Marcus Mariota from Oregon. Jameis Winston from Florida State, not Florida. Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football from Texas A&M. Robert Griffin III from Baylor, and Cam Newton from Auburn. You guys didn't know that? Oh, all right, here's one you'll get. Name the only two-time Heisman Trophy winner. There you go. You got one there. Good. Now, name the Academy Award winners for Best Actor and Actress in 2003 when Victory Lane Assembly of God launched. Anybody know? Come on, Adrian Brody from The Pianist and Nicole Kidman from the movie The Hours. The point is that most of us can't remember the big winners from a few years ago. These were the big shots, the ones that supposedly really made a difference. They were the best of their field. But how soon does the applause die away? How soon do all the lights begin to dim? Now, here's another kind of quiz. Can you remember a teacher who helped you in your early years in school? What about a friend who helped you through a difficult time? Who was the first person that told you about the love of Jesus Christ? You see, in your own life, the people who made a big difference, they may not be famous. They may not be super talented. They're probably average, everyday people that God put in your life at the right time, at the right moment. And they had a big influence on you. I could think back to the people who've done little things here at Victory Lane over the last 12 years. Many of you will not even recognize their names. But the little things they did made a big impact to where we're at today. You see, 
Jesus made himself of no reputation. You've heard me say this before, and it's worth qualifying all the time. Whenever we do outreach, or whenever we touch a person's life, we're not getting to the point of doing it to get them to come to Victory Lane Assembly of God. We're getting that to introduce them to Jesus Christ. The benefit and the plus is if they do come. And we've seen that happen. But so many times we get caught up. We get so emotionalized by a lot of these different things that are out there today. And this is what Jesus said about the kingdom of God. Small acts that have a big effect. In Matthew 25, Jesus gave the story about people who did small acts of kindness for others, giving them food or clothing or visiting the sick or those that were in prison, doing those small things. I love when people tell me the story of how God led them here to Victory Lane Assembly of God. I love the stories. I love to hear people tell me about what was encouraging about that that brought them here. Because you know what? It wasn't an influence that any one person or I may have made in that person's life, but it was the fact that they were led by the Spirit of God. Sometimes we forget about that. But here's what Jesus said about the final judgment day for those people. The king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it unto me. I want to share a story with you as we close this morning. Something that really just touched my heart this week. You know, sometimes when you're up here and you're preaching and you're preaching to the body of Christ and you, you're watching people serve in ministry and do different things. You just pray as a pastor that people are engaged and they're going to make a difference when they go out and, and they do ministry or, or, or whatever it may be. And this week I was really, really moved by one particular story. And this person didn't know I was going to share this story. But Kelly really felt prompted and led by the Holy Spirit to minister to the homeless on the streets of Painesville. She gathered up blankets. She gathered up other items. Other people saw what she was doing and gave her $40 of McDonald's gift certificates. And she went out and she ministered to those people on the streets handing them out these items. And it wasn't one time that she ever talked about the fact where she went to church, that she did it. They said, why are you doing this, ma'am? Because I just want to bless you. You see, no strings attached when we do ministry, when we touch people's lives. Well, you've got to have a church of 200 to go out and do that. At least 150. You can't have a church of 75 people to go out and minister to love. That's just not going to work. I tell you right now, take your focus off of me as the pastor. Put your focus on Jesus Christ. I'm your shepherd. I'll lead you. But take your focus off of me. You've heard me say before, you know, I, I, I may not get things right all the time. But when I stand before the Lord, I know, I know, I know, I know what I've done for Jesus Christ is going to last for eternity. It's not about the size of the church that I'm going to pastor. Have I been weary before? Yeah, you bet I have. How many of you in here, you've ever felt a place in time of your life when you were working, you felt like quitting your job? Just a couple of you, right? <laughs> but you know, sometimes we, get, sometimes we get so compacted with that, we get so 
laborsome, we get so weary, we get so focused on people that we're missing out on putting our ear to the Spirit. I was looking through all of the comments that were hit on Kelly's page, and this one woman was so blessed by what Kelly did. She says, I got 60 more dollars of coupons coming your way. Amen. But she did that because, not because anything that was a big glorifying message or anything. She felt led by the Spirit of God to do it. I'm a risk taker. I am a risk taker. I'll say that. I, I'm, I like to take risks. I know what it's like to live at bare bones minimum. I know what it's like to live on the streets. I know what it's like to work in ministry and, and, and not do it for a paycheck. You're doing it for people. What if we were to come in here on a Sunday morning and I said, hey, we're just going to go hit the streets in our community. Let's take up a love offering right now. We're going to go take up our love offering. And then we're also going to take up a special love offering. And we're just going to go in a tangible, practical way and just go minister to love of Jesus Christ. And I think about this. The other day, my wife and I were at lunch one day. And um, this couple was standing at Arby's. And they pulled out. They were counting their change. They were an older couple, just counting their change. And Mary just said, you know, she goes, she goes, go pay for their lunch. I don't have enough money. <laughs> The point is, is do we feel prompt to do those things? Do we feel prompt to just touch a person's life in a practical way? We're not talking just has to be dollars. We're not talking about that. What would it look like for us to go pray in the four corners of our city? What would that look like if we did it again? What are those things going to look like, ultimately? You know? Small things. We're talking small things here. You know why I believe that God has blessed this church? Is because we're faithful in small things. We're faithful in small things. And I confess to you, sometimes I get myself so caught up in happened early on in ministry, who's here, who's not here, those things. I, I confess to you, those things sometimes can take precedent. But the bottom line is this. And like in what was the kingdom of God like? What was it like? Are we willing to do those things in the name of Jesus? Amen? What if all made a point of us doing those small things. Not just during the week, but on that Sunday. What difference could a little congregation like Victory Lane make in a big city of men or men around the lake with a population of over 50,000 people? When God led you here, going back to the story of God led you here to Victory Lane Assembly of God, He spoke to your heart and He brought you here. God doesn't make mistakes. He's a perfect God. Right? He's a perfect God. And when he leads us to those places and does those things, do we believe that God can do those, the smallest things through us to accomplish the biggest thing for his glory and his purpose? Yeah. I do. I believe that. Little things. Be faithful in that which is least. Amen? Father, this morning, I know there's more in this message that I've prepared, but God, I believe this is where you want me to stop. And I want to be obedient to that. 
Lord, I pray right now that each of us, as we look at our own hearts and lives and do that own inventory, God, that you would help us to repent of those things sometimes that would take our focus off of serving you, taking our focus off of doing the things that you've called us to do. And Lord, I pray this morning that by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you'll lead us to places. You will fill the people with the Spirit of God. Touch our hearts. Tug on our hearts, God, this morning. And I pray today that as we move from this spot and come to a place of searching our own life, God, help us to look to you as the designer and the architect of what things will look like in our own life as we serve you as you call us to do the things that you called us to do as we preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and Lord to know that when we've done it unto them we've done it unto you so help us this morning God to repent of those things and to change those things in our own heart. God, that sometimes we get so hung up on the numbers, we get so hung up on who's here, who's not here. Lord, help us this morning to know that what it is that you're wanting us to do, where you're wanting us to serve, where you're wanting us to step into. And so, Lord, I, I pray today, God, as we leave here today burden us in our heart what some of those things are going to look like over these next several months and these next few years and Lord I pray that the spirit of God would lead us into those places lead us into the truth of what it is and so, Father, I pray, God, that our hearts would be challenged today. And that you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, would help us to apply this word to our life. What is the kingdom of God like? And are we faithful in those small things? Because how about those small things? She talked about that mustard. So thank you today, Lord, for your word. Thank you today because, Lord, we celebrate Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we celebrate that you are the resurrected King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, I pray, God, that uh, as you bring us back this next week, help us come with an anticipation. And we'll be sure to give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I want to just...